I'd like to talk to you today about the limits of machine learning. And I want to begin by sharing a personal story. In 2014, on my birthday, I opened my browser to see this. It was a happy birthday greeting from Google. My first reaction was, this is creepy. How did Google know that it was my birthday? I realized pretty soon that this question was naive. Of course, Google knew it was my birthday. I supplied Google with that information when I created my account. So my birthday is just about the most elementary thing that Google knows about me. Still, the experience made me wonder, how much does Google know about me? How much does Google know about us? And how worried should we be? Let's tackle these questions one by one. First, how much does Google know about us? And the answer is a lot. Google tracks our emails, all the files that you put in your G drive, all the videos that you watch on YouTube, all the comments that you make. And this is not a secret. If you look at the privacy page of your account, Google will tell you in black and white about all the information it collects about you. Based on this data, Google surmises insights about us. And if you want to know what Google thinks about you, look at the ad settings of your account. If you can imagine, there are hundreds of millions of people who use Google and who have Google accounts. And so Google is collecting hundreds of millions of data points every day, every moment of every day. From these millions and millions of data points, it is able to make intelligent guesses about what we might buy, what we like to do, where we like to go, and how we might be influenced or nudged. It does this through a process called machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence where masses and masses of data are collected and analyzed using sophisticated algorithms. The purpose is to gain insight about users. In my own field of artificial intelligence and education, we use information like this to determine which students are frustrated, which students are bored, which students are disengaging from the learning task. And then we try to use this information to try to get students back on task, to help them make better use of the resources that are available to them, and to guide them towards better learning. So really, machine learning can help us solve some of the most wicked problems that we have in the world today. Machine learning can be good. So how worried should we be? What we have to bear in mind is that machine learning has its limits. And I would like to take this opportunity to talk about six of these limits today. Remember this image that I shared with you earlier? I said that machine learning and machine learning models depend on data. The models are built on massive quantities of data. And this brings us to our first limitation. Data is inherently biased. Much of the data that is used to train these models come from weird countries, and I'm not trying to be derogatory here. WEIRD is an acronym that stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. Data about people such as you and me from the developing world, it's not often represented in these data sets. Second, machine learning models tend to be opaque. That is to say, they are black boxes. It's difficult to understand how they arrive at a particular conclusion. And as machine learning algorithms become more and more sophisticated and more and more complex, so do the models. So it becomes harder and harder to understand and explain how the models work. Let me give you an example. If you are a student in the United Kingdom and you want to go to university, you have to take a set of exams called the A-levels. 
The A-levels are a high-stakes exam that universities use to determine who gets offered admission. In 2020, because of the coronavirus, the A-level exams were canceled. So what did the Ministry of Education of the UK do? They used a machine-learned algorithm to predict the scores of the students who wanted to go to university. What happened? 40% of students got grades that were lower than what they expected and what their teachers expected. And it took literally months for people to understand how and why this happened. Third limitation, outcomes can be discriminatory. Remember I said the data is inherently biased? If you're starting with a data set that is inherently biased, then your model will be inherently biased. There was a documentary film entitled Coded Bias that was released. In it, there was a story about a computer science researcher from MIT named Joy Buolamuini. Her area of specialization was facial recognition. And she found that facial recognition software is unable to recognize African-American faces. Why? Because the data sets that are used to train these algorithms were predominantly Caucasian. Now, Joy herself is a person of color. And for facial recognition software to see her face, or to even recognize that she has a face, she has to wear a white mask. Even subtle biases in language are codified. Have you ever tried using Google Translate? Try translating the sentence, Sha ay doctor, from Filipino to English. This will translate to, he is a doctor. Now, try translating, Sha ay nurse. This will translate to, she is a nurse. Doctors are men. Nurses are women. The models capture bias. Fourth, applications of machine learning can be manipulative and controlling. In 2019, the Wall Street Journal released a video about how China uses AI for education. In it, there was a segment about how a primary school in China uses EEG headbands if you look at the light in the middle of the forehead, you'll see that if it glows red, that means that the student is concentrating. If it's blue, that means the student is distracted. This data is sent to parents and to teachers in real time. On the upside, teachers said that students concentrated better and studied harder. So that's good. But students also reported that they would get home and be get punished if they weren't concentrating enough in school. When the new story came out, there was an uproar, and the use of the headbands was discontinued. Limitation number five. The effects of these models can cascade and scale. Remember my story about the A-level exams in the UK? 40% of students were affected. That's 280,000 individuals. And it wasn't just them. It was also the universities. By the time there were protests and by the time their grades had been corrected, the universities had already offered admission to the students who had qualified based on the old scores. The government, in the face of the protests, had to make a U-turn, and they had to upgrade the scores of all these students whose, whose scores were previously downgraded. So now, all of a sudden, there were all these students with better scores, and they went running to the universities, telling them, hey, I'm qualified. Offer me admission. So you can imagine how messy the situation was. Let me tell you one more story. In 2014, there was a paper that was published about a massive Facebook experiment. 
Facebook took two groups of users, group one, group two. Group one was shown fewer positive posts, and group two was shown fewer negative posts. What happened? Group one, the group that was shown fewer positive posts, also posted fewer positive posts. And group two, the group that was shown fewer negative posts, they also posted fewer negative posts. So think about that for a moment. What's the take home message? The take home message is if you want to manipulate how people feel, manipulate their newsfeed. This brings us to perhaps the most critical of all these limitations. Applications reflect the values of those who control or own the models. In 2016, a company called Cambridge Analytica made headlines because they used Facebook data to help influence the US presidential elections. They used what they learned about users to send targeted political messaging and advertising to influence the vote. There were even allegations that Cambridge Analytica used similar tactics to influence our own presidential elections here in the Philippines. Now, exactly how influential Cambridge Analytica was is the subject of debate. However, what I'd like to highlight here is that there are people controlling how these models are used. And they're the ones who deserve a little more consideration. So how worried should we be? Think of the people behind the models. Ask yourself, who are they? What is their agenda? What purposes do they serve? Do you trust them? That's how worried you should be. What I would like you to remember is that all these stories that I've told you about the A-levels, about the school in China, about Cambridge Analytica, they have a common hero, us, humanity. Machine learned models have blind spots and they do not have the self-awareness to know where these blind spots are. So it's up to you and me, it's up to us, to point out these limitations and to demand truth, transparency, fairness, ethics, of these algorithms and from the people who control them. Kathy O'Neill, the author of a book entitled Weapons of Math Destruction, summarizes this, this sentiment perfectly. She says, machine learning models codify the past. They do not invent the future. Doing so requires moral imagination and that's something only humans can provide. We have to explicitly embed better values into our algorithms, creating models that follow our ethical lead.